This episode of Seminary Dropout is sponsored by the new book from Nav Press, Fish Sandwiches by Troy Schmidt. So you probably know that the story of the resurrection is chronicled in all four Gospels. But there's another story, another miracle that's chronicled in all four Gospels, and it's the feeding of the 5,000. This caught Troy Schmidt's attention, and he dug into why it would be that this miracle was important enough to be in all four Gospels. What can we learn from these people who received from Jesus, and what can it teach us about receiving God's promises today? So check out the book that Max Lucado calls A Joy to the Heart and Strength to the Soul. You can find fish sandwiches wherever books are sold. You can also find a link to it on the show notes for this episode of Seminary Dropout. So go check out fish sandwiches today. You're listening to Seminary Dropout, and I'm your host, Shane Blackshear. In cooperation with MissioAlliance.org, straight from my house in Austin, Texas to yours, interviews with leading Christian authors, leaders, and thinkers, because good theology should be for everyone. This is Seminary Dropout. Let's go. My guest, Kathy Kong, is Director of Campus Access Initiatives with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship USA. She previously was InterVarsity's Regional Multi-Ethnic Director and Area Director for Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. She's a speaker, journalist, and activist, a columnist for Sojourners Magazine, and a co-author of More Than Serving Tea, Asian American Women on Expectations, Relationships, Leadership, and Faith. Her new book is called Raise Your Voice, Why We Stay Silent and How to Speak Up. Kathy, thanks for being on Seminary Dropout. Thanks for having me here. So your parents brought you here from South Korea when you were eight months old. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Did you grow up with a sense of knowing that your parents were recent immigrants to the U.S.? I did, actually. Um, We lived on the north side of Chicago, and... It was very clear, and they had made it very clear to me and my younger sister, who was born in Chicago, that we were Korean American. So not just ethnically and culturally, but at that time, uh, I think it was just my mom who went through the naturalization process. So even citizenship wise, they made it very clear that they were immigrants that I, even as an eight month old baby was an immigrant and really the only American born in the family was my sister. Well, you and your family went to a a Korean church while you were growing up, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. It was the Korean United Methodist church in Chicago. And, um, I think one of the first photographs of my family having recently immigrated to Chicagoland was in front of church. <laughs> and that's how our, our journey was documented. It's, it's always been a part of life. I mean, I think that a lot of us tend to think of children of immigrants or at least, you know, children that came to the U.S. at a very young age and grew up here that, this is the only life that they know. And I think to an extent that's true, but you also, for your story, it seems like you grew up in and around and connecting with a South Korean community. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We were not supposed to live in Chicago. Actually, it was just a stop on our way east. And my father has extended family in this area who, you know, they had all immigrated not too long before we did. But because there was a family network, they all encouraged my parents to stay here in Chicago and they would help us settle in. And so the the experience of growing up was very much for us connected to a Korean church experience as well. So, um, you know, once I started school on Monday through Friday, it was in the neighborhood with my school friends, but definitely the weekends, probably starting Friday night, there was any kind of 
you know, combination of church meetings or church uh, family gatherings up through the weekend. So it was very clear um, kind of division of what family time looked like. So during the week, it's school and family. And then um, during the weekend, it was church and church was very immigrant church centric. Did you have a sense growing up of like what um, American white evangelicalism look like? (laughs) That's a great question. I didn't until I would say hmm, maybe elementary school maybe middle school. I do recall um, a friend, Tammy McGee, who invited me to Awana. Oh, wow. And I had no idea what that was. It sounded like a club. And it was at her church, a Baptist church. And it sounded fun. And so I went and yeah, that was my first experience of like American white evangelicalism in a big sort of way. Um, and boy, was it, <laughs> it was so wild. Um, I had no category for it. Um, you know, the memorization, the prizes, the, the number of people, it just was so bizarre to me. And I think I went a few times, but it definitely was not something I was going to continue to go and participate in. Um, But I also was exposed to it via interns at our immigrant churches. So at some point, um, Sunday school can no longer be taught by the grownups because the language gap becomes so big. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. And so we, I grew up um, going to Sunday school, being taught by Moody Bible Institute students and was just talking about this this morning with my boss. Many people do not know that my roots in Christianity are very conservative very, um, yeah, very conservative, very white. And so it was a Moody Bible Institute student, John Beazle, who walked me through the prayer. And, um, but the culture was still the immigrant church. So, he, you know, these interns would come and they would have to figure out what the heck was going on at this church and why it operated differently. And, oh, the kids and the families they're all korean but are they korean are they american what's the deal the Mm. kids all speak english but the parents don't necessarily speak english or aren't as fluent or they don't want to teach sunday school what's going on so i those would be my two most vivid memories of exposure to kind of white church experience (laughs) i unfortunately i don't know a lot of uh, Korean history, but it seems like Christianity really started to flourish in uh, Korea and South Korea after the Second World War. And so I wonder, I'm assuming that your parents were uh, believers in Korea before they came to the U.S.? Yes, yes. So both my mom and my dad and my father's side in particular have roots with the Methodist church in Korea. And then my, my paternal grandmother was also um, deeply involved with uh, adoptees, placing adoptees. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, Do you know, was there a sense for them that, you know, obviously Christianity wasn't outlawed in Korea, but it was a minority. And, and the U.S. has such this, um, uh, uh, pro, you know, unearned reputation for being a Christian nation. Um, <laughs> was that something that, that they were aware of when they came to the U.S.? And, and was that comforting to them or were they indifferent to that? Do you know? Yeah. So my, um, so it was just my parents and I who immigrated, my paternal grandparents stayed in Korea. And then my maternal grandmother, who was the only one 
um, alive at the time of our immigration. She didn't immigrate until I want to say the late seventies, but, um, for their experience, what I know of, there was never a sense of, um, uh, persecution or even kind of minority, uh, religious experience. Hmm. And I think in part because, uh, socially their, uh, their circles were all majority Christian. Their immediate families were all at church and, my grandmother's work was tied to the church. Um, and because in a, in a fairly homogenous country, they, um, a lot of their cultural practices kind of flowed in and out of different religious practices. Hmm. So, um, our families in South Korea didn't practice, uh, say ancestor worship because, well, Christians don't do that, (laughs) but there are certain practices culturally that we still maintain that are loosely connected to other religions and not because of its religious ties, but more of the cultural ties. And so I think the switch, the move here to the U S was helped immensely for my parents because there was a church and there was a Korean immigrant church that they could root their family in. I want to talk more just about your, your life and your story. You, you go to college and you major in journalism and then you move to green Bay and you work at the newspaper there and you're a journalist for a while. And then you feel called into ministry and I wonder, was there a sense of uh, feeling like the the Christianity that you practice in the Korean church was uh, different and even looked down upon by the majority of evangelicals that you encountered? I don't know if it was so much being put down. It certainly was different. And I think that because I stayed even in college was with an Asian American student fellowship and attended a church that was planted by a white man who was the child of missionaries to Korea. Hmm. Um, That even in my kind of college years, my church and faith experience was this uh, beautiful blend of, Korean Asian immigrant slash white evangelical. <laughs> so, um, so for example, prayer meetings. I think that college students still pray <laughs> during the day. I just remember that the group of students I connected with prayed in a certain way that felt very Korean felt very Korean American. It was, um, it was loud. It was passionate. Um, we would take turns. We could all pray in one voice. That was the way it was called. And, um, and for those of us who grew up in the Korean American church, it was not unusual to do things like fast when we were planning a retreat or in the schedule for, a college retreat, we would include early morning prayer. And that was just part of my Korean church experience. It wasn't until I would say adulthood when I came on staff with InterVarsity and met, you know, white evangelicals to find that our spiritual practices and disciplines looked different. We still had the value for all of those things, but it definitely looked different. And then it wasn't until I would say 12, 13 years ago when I, as an adult, married with older children, we decided we were going to join a community church, a neighborhood church where we would only have to drive a few minutes. And that really was my biggest, most consistent experience of having to kind of be immersed in white evangelicalism. 
And that's when I was like, I am a fish out of my pond. I don't know what's <laughs> going on. Um, the culture was different. The, the music felt different. I felt weird because I was clapping. Mm. <laughs> and I know that there were things that were unique to the church itself and the existing congregation and their traditions. But it definitely felt that was definitely my fish out of water experience. And, you know, I ask those questions because the, the, the book is about raising your voice and mm -hmm. those these qualities of um, being Asian American in America and being a woman. Um, those are things that really factor into one's daily experience and the way they are in the world and being comfortable and confident and feeling like your words are going to be received by people. Right. Right. And I, I had a very clear sense of places where what I said mattered and contexts in which they did. Uh, and it always differed. Right. I, I learned early on that you have to speak up in class if the teacher is going to count for participation, mm. I hate participation points. <laughs> uh, my now sophomore in college son, we were just talking about that yesterday about why one of his grades was lower and it was in part because of participation points and, um, and what that participation looks like and how it's supposed to be raise your hand, say the right answer, but don't raise your hand too many times because then you look like a brown noser. <laughs> um, and then learning, uh, you know, at home, you can, you can say certain things, but there are a lot of things you can't because you are a child, because you are a daughter, because um, that's not how you do things in a respectful Korean family. And then there are certain times that you can speak up in church, like when you have the right Bible verse or you have the right answer to a question, but don't raise your hand if you have a question about the mm. Bible. <laughs> don't raise your hand if you disagree with something that the Sunday school teacher is teaching. And so, you know, I, we all have those experiences in which our participation in our voice is either affirmed or shut down. I think that exists across the board for anyone. Uh, for me, it was very much learning how to code switch and learning how to read a room that wasn't my Korean immigrant church or it wasn't a classroom of classmates I knew and trusted or a workplace that was new and I had no seniority and what were the unspoken signals given to me or spoken direct signals about um, affirmative action and, and diversity hiring and all of those types of things that go on on a daily basis. And so I think because of the varied experiences that I had and having to learn how to read and code switch teaches people of color at a very early age, how to be in essence, bilingual. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to learn a separate language other than English. You just learn how to use your language in different ways in different contexts. Hmm. I'm going to ask this next question for a specific reason, but growing up, yeah. did you, did you visit uh, South Korea? I did. I did. I went back um, in elementary school. I think we were back twice. And then I went back right before college. Yeah. So that's what I want to ask about, because you yeah. found out that you weren't a citizen just before yes. you went to college. Yes. Um, that sounds like that has got to be a really jarring experience. Yes. It was very strange and bizarre. Um, and and unsure of what the implications were. So it was a quick, you know, I think there was a moment of panic, like, well, wait, what does that mean? 
<laughs> am, am I a citizen? Am I, do I, am I documented? Like, what is, what does that mean? And it quickly turned out that, yes, I was documented and I had a green card, but that it was very outdated. <laughs> had a and picture of you that, as an infant yeah. on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was, it was a picture of me as a baby and, um, and that green card was green. Um, and so the, the choice was given to me whether or not I would go through the naturalization process, or if I would choose to keep my South Korean citizenship because at the time, and I don't know, I don't believe they offer official dual citizenship, but at the time it was, you pick one or the other. And you know, I, I was headed to college. I, I was still wrestling with what ethnic identity meant. And I decided I would keep my South Korean passport and citizenship. And so I had my green card renewed, at which point I realized that green cards were no longer green and traveled with a South Korean passport. And it was very jarring as somebody who was trying to figure out where home was, um, I had grown up in Chicago land. That's really the only home geographically that I knew. I had never gone to school in South Korea and yet it was very clear, especially after we moved out of the North side of Chicago to the suburbs that I was not white and therefore I wasn't American which helped me decide that I was going to keep my Korean citizenship at the time. And then traveling to Korea was jarring because it was so obvious when I was traveling around the country and even to my relatives that I wasn't Korean, Korean. My, there was a, there was an American accent to my Korean, my mannerisms, my, my tone, the fact that I didn't, want to carry a parasol while I was walking around to protect my skin from the sun. I mean, all sorts of little things that made me stand out as a Korean American versus a Korean. So I came back from that trip messed up, <laughs> messed up. <laughs> didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know how to identify myself. I didn't know where home was. It was so comforting to be in a country where no one was going to stare at me or ever ask me where I learned my English, um, where I was from, where are you really from? Um, it was wonderful to be there. And there was a deep comfort. And, and then coming back to the U.S. also then felt jarring because I knew how to operate here. This was the only country I knew. And yet I still didn't feel like I had a place. Yeah, I think all those things must have mattered and at times made you feel like um, like your voice wasn't one that you should put out there or at least made you hesitant to do so. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, it's until you can find people who understand that kind of identity journey, it's difficult to really talk about or to understand and process. There isn't a, a necessarily a category in that, or at least I didn't think there would be until I landed in college and met more Asian Americans who also felt as confused and longed for a sense of place and identity and value to the stories that we had, which certainly were not stories that we grew up hearing in history class or reading about in literature or seeing in movies and television. So it was, it was confusing. I mean, I knew I wasn't white and I knew I wasn't white the minute I moved to the suburbs. It wasn't a category I cared about when I was living and growing up in elementary school on the north side of Chicago. We lived in a community where it was, there were, all of my childhood friends were immigrants. <laughs> there was no, 
that just was the norm. And then when we moved out to the burbs, it was just crazy land it was crazy land. Um, and so then you begin to question whether or not anything that comes out of your mouth makes sense because it doesn't necessarily match what people think should go with the face or the name or the smells in your home. And, um, and it, I think it still, it still happens. It still happens even in my late forties where there are conversations about what is being taught about immigration in the elementary school and the textbooks by and large stop at Ellis Island. Hmm. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, it's great that these little kids are learning about Ellis Island, but they need to understand that immigration is still happening and it's, it's, it's people like me that can say, well, I can't bring you up to date, but I can bring you up to the seventies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds a lot like the experiences that I hear from people who are biracial, who, you know, have their own communities or maybe are ev- able to uh, work in the, the races that they represent, but uh, in some ways by some people are not, fully trusted by either of those races that they belong to completely. Sure, sure. I definitely think there's an element to that and that sense of belonging. One, you know, one ethnicity, one race, and having kind of a foot in multiple spaces. I think uh, for me, and I, I say this with some hesitancy because I cannot speak for all the millions of Asian Americans, but even the label Asian American is an interesting one because we Asian Americans, we don't have a common language. We don't have a common country. We have a common continent. And so our history, even here as Asian Americans starts way back, but depending on when your family came If we, you know, if we are first generation, second generation, all of that, I think, is such a difficult label and place to hold. So even in in that space of being Asian American, that, too, is really interesting because it wasn't until college I would call myself Asian American. Until then, it was very much I'm Korean American. Hmm. I speak Korean. I grew up with Korean parents. We eat Korean food. It's not. Asian food. It's very specific Korean food. Um, and so I think in that respect, uh, that's, that would be the, the bigger difference between a bi, like a bicultural racial biracial experience, because even for my nieces and nephews who are all biracial, um, they are still also fully Korean. And so they walk in that tension, but what their, their different layer is that they, their physical features and their last names, (laughs) um, may help them pass into whiteness. Mm, Sure. And, and so sometimes I will start my talks if I'm being asked to speak about race and ethnicity, sometimes I will start my talks by introducing myself as, and I want to let you know, I am not white because that label of Asian American has also been used, uh, to divide amongst people of color and that myth of the model minority, and saying, oh, well, Asian Americans made it. They pulled themselves up from their bootstraps. Look how successful they are, and they are well-educated, and all those types of things that happen when you lump a huge group of people (laughs) into one. So it gets complicated. (laughs) (laughs) You, in the book, see a lot of yourself, and a lot of your story has a enabled you to see some things in the book of the Bible, Esther, and the person of Esther. And I wonder 
what are what are some of those things about Esther that you see that probably um, it's it's who you are, it's your story that's allowed you to see in that book? Mm-hmm. Um, I love the fact that even though it is one of the rare books of the Bible named after a woman, we actually don't hear from Esther until I believe the fourth chapter of a very short book. (laughs) And um, when I sit with the whole story and the book of Esther, that's how I often feel is the case for um, my story and women of color is that we are not the ones who tell our own story. And when we finally do, our voice is not heard until later. Hmm. And, um, and there are so many things in Esther's story I connect with and wrestle with. I mean, you know, her relationship with her cousin slash uncle Mordecai and the listening to elders, even though it doesn't always make sense, or maybe it does. The fact that he encourages her to hide her Jewishness and that she should not go by Hadassah, she should go by Esther. Mm. And then when the Jews are in trouble, suddenly he wants her to own her Jewishness. So (laughs) I think those are the types of stories or the the way I see Esther's story evolve. I think, oh, I, I I relate to that there are things that you do as an immigrant, as a person of color um, to pass culturally. And the idea that some of us have given names and then we have our American names and we use our American names because it's far more convenient. We get tired of correcting people and, um, And so the idea that Esther is also Hadassah is something that I hold to. She's not one or the other. She is fully both. Mm. (laughs) She is fully both. And that is something that has been part of my journey. And in part, you know, realizing, oh, I am not a U.S. citizen. Am I going to claim and go through the process so that I can be fully invested in um, the workings of the U S policy politics use that right to vote. And can I fully be my Korean immigrant self and still pass on cultural traditions to my children who will probably never go by their Korean given names, but know the story and know the meaning of their Korean given names. So, you know, Esther is definitely one of those books where I think, I approached very differently until my thirties or so, you know, up until then it was just, she was really, really pretty and she won a beauty pageant and she was queen and she had beauty treatments for a year. I mean, who, what woman doesn't want that? (laughs) Um, But then kind of going, you know, way deeper than that and realizing, oh, this is, this is a lot of being displaced and assimilation and survival. And, and then do you choose to associate with your people? And how will you do that? And I think that's one of those moments in Esther's story where I think, oh, yes, that's, that's the moment when you go, I'm fully, I'm fully American and I'm fully Korean and it may not make any sense, but that's why I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I mean, most sermons that we hear about the book of Esther are about Queen Esther, about the privileged person of, of Esther, because a lot of times those sermons are given by privileged people and that's one lens you can look at that through but sure. also like you mentioned she was a displaced person she was yeah. an immigrant yeah yeah and she was most likely a teenager you know so 
when when I hear Queen Esther, I think of, well, you know, I'll be honest, I think of Queen Elizabeth, right? And I go to Britain and I think of, <laughs> sure, um, you know, the the lovely story of the royals and the royal wedding that's happening and all those types of lovely things. Um, but but the audacity of God inviting this young, very young woman um, who, who has to rely on men. She has to trust Mordecai. She has to trust um, the people put in charge of her. And she knows, she knows what the rules are, right? She knows that if she approaches the king, she could die. And it's not, she's not saying this out of the idea of being queen like we might associate with royalty in modern day. And I think the idea, you know, I, I've heard so many sermons preached about and um, love Mordecai's call to Esther. You know, perhaps you have been called to a royal position such a, for such a time as this. And yet really here in the U.S., I think we're more we need to more put ourselves in the place of, say, Haman hmm. or the king who didn't realize that his power be, was being used uh, to call for genocide, right? So if we do a deeper study of the book, the king is surprised that this is happening and that he approved it because he gave his ring to Haman. Hmm. <laughs> and maybe sometimes we are Haman or maybe sometimes we are Haman's friends and his wife who are the ones who suggest impaling Mordecai. <laughs> And saying maybe that'll make you feel better. So it, there's so much in that text and in that story that I think here in the U.S. we can misplace ourselves as the hero heroine and really eh, <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. Um, yeah, probably not. <laughs> probably not. We don't get the idea that the the king is um, malicious, you know, yeah. he's kind of unaware. Yeah. And yeah. the things that his passive power is, is doing in the world. Right. Right. And, and I think, isn't that, I mean, isn't that what privilege is? Isn't that what power is? Is it's not, it's not the person sitting at the button waiting to be told fire the missile that that's yeah. not the power that's that's part of it but i think every one of us has a degree of power and privilege in which we do not recognize how our choices impact the lives of others over time esther had to count the cost right she and all of us who choose to speak out and raise our voice in the context of other leaders we have to recognize there is a choice. Sometimes we will be listened to. Sometimes we will be ridiculed. Sometimes we will be shut down. Sometimes we will be labeled as troublemakers. Um, in my ministry context, sometimes you speak out too many times about something that other people will disagree with. And what happens is they decide not to financially support your ministry. <laughs> there are choices that we all have to make. But at the end of the day, um, it's it's not just a leadership issue. For me, it's you know it's a gospel issue. It's a faith issue. Will you speak truth according to what you hold as your beliefs? And if you don't have the courage to do that, then what is the worth of what you believe in? And I would like to think that the things I believe in and the, the things other people believe in and they speak out on behalf of are worth listening to and worth learning from. I know th that has shaped me as a person, as a writer, as a leader. Um, and I'd like to think of myself better for that, listening to other people, doing the thing that I'm inviting people to think about, which is to raise their voice. Well, Kathy Kong, it's been so good to get to talk with you. Thanks for being on Seminary Dropout. Thank you.
Thanks for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Remember, you can find all the show notes for this show and all shows at shaneblackshear.com. Oh, and hey, have you ever thought about starting your very own podcast? I bet you have. And I think you should do it. In fact, I've created a course just for you to teach you everything that I've learned over the last couple of years producing Seminary Dropout. So if you're interested in podcasting and want to learn how, go check out my course. You can go there by typing in podcastingforeveryone.org. And you can get a special discount by typing in the discount code Seminary Dropout, all one word. That'll give you 25% off. So go check it out. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. Thanks to those that left ratings and reviews on iTunes this week. Remember, that keeps the show front and center. Also, remember, you can find me on Twitter at at Beard on a Bike. That's at Beard on a Bike. Also, I'm on Facebook, facebook.com slash Shane Blackshear123. And remember that Seminary Dropout is listener supported. You can visit supportseminarydropout.com and press become a patron. Remember, this music you're listening to right now is by D.L. Rossi. You can find him online on iTunes and at dlrossi.com. All right, thanks again for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Love you. Take care. Yeah,